Amen. Thank you, Brother Eric, and thank you to our uh, musicians, our team of worship leaders that have led us in such a wonderful worship service. And uh, Eric and I didn't really talk and coordinate anything, but the songs that the Lord laid upon his heart to sing this morning uh, are certainly right in line with what I'm going to be preaching this morning. God is our mighty fortress. And when Eric talked about how we don't uh, wage war with the same tools that the world wages war with, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, we're going to again pick up in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes as Jesus is continuing to lead his listeners and us as we are now the beneficiaries of this sermon. He's leading us down the gospel path to happiness, leading us down the gospel path to joy. We say, well, what leads to joy for the citizen of, of God's kingdom? And here in the Beatitudes, Jesus is telling us, He's making it plain what it is that leads to joy and blessedness, happiness for the child of God. We've begun at the starting point on the gospel path. We talked about poorness of spirit, a keen understanding that there's nothing in you that commends you to God, that you're a spiritual beggar, that you're a spiritual pauper, that you're in desperate need of help outside of yourself. Last week, we looked at the next waypoint on this gospel path to happiness. We looked at mourning over sin. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who realize their spiritual bankruptcy and respond to it with mourning. Who realize that they've fallen short of the glory of God. And it's not just a mental ascent, but it breaks their hearts. We mourn over our sin. And when we do, when we experience that godly sorrow over sin, it leads to repentance. And being poor in spirit and mourning over that spiritual bankruptcy lead to joy because Jesus attaches a gospel promise to them, doesn't he? He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Poorness of spirit and mourning and all the other uh, blessings that Jesus pronounces here have promises attached to them. And that's what makes them the path to happiness. In case I haven't done a good job of making that plain until now, let's spend just a moment doing so. When we look through these Beatitudes, with every one of them, we see a gospel promise that is attached to it. With every one of them, Jesus makes a promise. The poor in spirit, uh, to theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For those who mourn, they shall be comforted. And, and today we're going to see yet another gospel promise attached to Jesus' pronouncement of blessing. Today we're going to look at this next Mark on the gospel map to joy and blessedness. And of course, again, we're going to see an amazing promise that comes along with it. And I also want to take just a moment this morning to remind us that what Jesus mentions in these Beatitudes are not salvific in and of themselves. I think it's important for us to remind ourselves of this here. Jesus isn't saying that to be saved uh, th this is a checkoff list that we have to do. Today we're going to be talking about meekness. And so Jesus isn't saying, listen, if you make yourself meek enough, then you'll belong to God's kingdom. Jesus is saying that when you are a citizen of God's kingdom, these beatitudes, the, these pronouncements of blessing, these traits that he's talking about, they're going to be the result of the fact that your citizenship has changed from the kingdom of this world to God's kingdom. It's very much the same idea that Paul talks about when he's talking about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. We read what the fruits of the Spirit are. And when we read those, we don't say that these are things that we must do to receive the Holy Spirit, do we? 
In fact, it's the exact opposite. We say that when we have experienced the Holy Spirit of God, when He has taken up residence in our life, then the outworking of His presence in us, the outworking of the fact that the Holy Spirit now resides in us is going to be these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. All these things are a result of His work in our lives. They are the fruits of of the Spirit. They're evidences of of His work in the lives of His people. In the same way, these Beatitudes are evidences of grace in the lives of God's people. They are a result of God's grace, of God's election. If you've been called out from death unto life, the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? If you've been called out from death unto life, then there's going to be some markers that are showing up in your life that are clear evidences of the fact that you now belong to God. If you're a citizen of God's kingdom, then these things are going to be true of you. And that's what Jesus is pointing them to here in these Beatitudes. Today we're going to be Picking up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Let's read that together. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together with our faith family and to worship you to exalt the name of Christ, to be confronted with your word, to be reminded of your goodness, to enjoy your promises. God, I pray that everything that we do this morning would be for your honor and your glory. We thank you for the songs that we've sang. We thank you for the fellowship that we've experienced. And now, God, we thank you for this time that we're going to come together and rejoice around your word. And Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross. I pray that you would hide the preacher and that Christ and Christ alone would be magnified this morning. God, we ask that you would work in the lives of your people that you would break our hearts over our sin, that you would remind us of our deep need for you, that you would show us how it is that you would have us to live and how it is that you would have us to respond to your word this morning. God, I pray that if there be any among us today that doesn't know Christ, that doesn't know the blessedness of a relationship with the God of the universe, Lord, I pray that you would open their mind and their hearts to understand their need for him and to receive his finished work. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and magnified among us this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And once again this morning, we see a very stark difference between what Jesus says is blessed and what the world values. A mind that is set on worldly things, a mind that is set on earthly things, would rarely look at the virtue or the trait of meekness and call it blessed, at least in the way that we often define meekness. In fact, you may hear the trait of a meek spirit defined in a very negative light. The English Oxford Dictionary puts a bit of a negative spin on their definition of meek. In their definition, the word meek describes one who is easily imposed upon. And so many people, when they think about this particular trait, what is it that they're thinking about? Someone that's a pushover. Someone that might be easy to manipulate. Someone that doesn't make much of a fuss when they're being taken advantage of. Someone that will sit back and allow you to do whatever it is that you want to do to them. And the, the world would say that someone who is meek is what? Weak, right? That, that someone who is meek is weak. They're not strong. They're unwilling to speak for themselves. They're quiet. They're timid. Basically, in the world's mind, calling someone meek is often 
a nice way of saying that they aren't strong. How do you want to say someone is weak, to say that they're not strong and make it sound a little nicer than coming right out with it? Well, you call them meek, right? They're, they're just a little meek. They're a little too timid. They're a little too weak. They're a little too quiet. And while that's a common way to hear the word used in a negative sense, the virtue itself is often commonly misunderstood, I would say, especially in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll commonly hear meekness or, or see this virtue misapplied. In fact, there are churches full of men who have been told over and over that they have to give up their masculinity in order to be meek. There are churches full of men who have been told over and over that living out their God-given masculinity is anti-Christian. Churches full of men who have been told that they have to suppress who it is that God has made them to be, that Christ-likeness looks like a suppression of their godly masculinity. Now, obviously, when I use the term masculinity, I'm not talking about a sinful expression of that that often shows up in uh, a demeaning spirit toward women or misogyny or whatever other way that you want to describe it. But we have churches that are full of men that have been told, listen, you need to be Christ-like. In order to be Christ-like, you need to be meek. In order to be meek, what you need to do is suppress your God-given masculinity. Make sure that you're not uh, trying to uh, usurp the role of women. Make sure that you're not trying to lead too much. We have, a church, we have churches full of men that are no longer confident to lead and provide. They're no longer confident to address things that are wrong because they've been told that doing so is not meek. That gentleness flowing from a meek spirit looks like feminized men that are constantly deferring leadership, afraid to speak against sin, afraid of being called a misogynist, afraid of standing for truth for fear that they'll be called a bigot. There are all kinds of different ways that we can misunderstand meekness. For some, meekness is weakness. And for others, meekness means that we need to suppress our God-given masculinity. Well, friends, this morning I want to make it clear that meekness is not weakness, and weakness is not a virtue. Meekness is not weakness, and weakness is not a virtue. This is commonly a uh, misunderstood word that, that Jesus is extolling here. And it's led folks to outright rejecting any attempt at it and becoming brutes that only care for themselves. And it's led to some in the church thinking that they can never be bold. And I would submit to you this morning that both of those are terrible conclusions. We don't need to uh, be brutes that only think of self. We don't need to reject meekness. We don't, we don't need to, to view it as, as weakness or, or some negative thing because Jesus is extolling it here. Jesus is saying that it's wonderful, that it's a, it's a virtue that you as a citizen of God's kingdom ought to possess. But we also don't need to take it so far that we strip men and, and, and others of their boldness. Both of those are terrible conclusions. I want to look at two scriptures that may help us here. I think that there's a godly balance that's struck in the Bible. Look with me at Philippians 2. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 3. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 3. Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, oftentimes we see that word humility and meekness and gentleness sort of used interchangeably. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so, what is it that we absolutely cannot be in the church? 
We can't reject meekness. We can't reject this virtue that Christ is extolling here and, and say, you know what? I, I, what, what's most important for me is that I look out for number one. What's most important for me is that I make sure my, myself and my people are well taken care of. Meekness looks like not looking to your own interests, but looking to the interests of others. Meekness looks like putting yourself on the back burner. Meekness looks like living with the spirit of humility. But meekness also doesn't mean that we aren't bold. Living with a spirit of meekness or, or living with this particular virtue doesn't mean that we aren't bold, that we don't stand firm on the truth. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 beginning in verse 13. Paul says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. To the men, he says, Act like men. Be strong. But then in verse 14, he follows it up with, Let all that you do be done in love. So do you see the balance there? Do you see the balance with which we ought to be relating to one another? There's a sense in which we must be bold. We must stand up for the truth. We must be willing to, to die on the hill of the truth while at the same time making sure that what we're doing is being done in love. Making sure that love is the motivator there. Let's take some time to look at this word meek. What does the word meek even mean? Well, a simple definition of the word meek in the original language is a mildness of disposition and a gentleness of spirit. A mildness of disposition and a gentleness of spirit. If we follow out the context here like we've done before, what have we made, made it clear that Jesus is talking about? When Jesus says, blessed are the poor, what's he mean? He's not necessarily, he's not at all talking about a financial situation, is he? He's not talking about a material poorness. He's talking about a spiritual poorness. When Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, what do we make it clear last week that he's talking about? Well, he's not just applying it across the gamut of human experience to any and every mourning that we may experience. He's talking about those that mourn over sin, Right? And so here, when Jesus is talking about meekness, if we follow out that context and we seek to apply it appropriately, he's simply saying, he, he's talking about meekness in a spiritual nature or a spiritual sense. And this meekness flows from the first two virtues that Jesus spoke about. When one realizes their own spiritual bankruptcy and is heartbroken over it, the result will be what? A humble view of self. We, we can't possibly realize our deep spiritual need, our deep spiritual bankruptcy, our, our nothing in us that would commend us toward God and be heartbroken over that while at the same time being puffed up toward others. That's not how that works. And so Jesus is, is really giving us a natural progression here, isn't he? When we understand our poorness of spirit, it leads to what? Mourning over sin. And when we, when we own and embrace and understand that spiritual bankruptcy and we're heartbroken over it, then the natural progression is that we have a very humble view of self. We understand who we are before God, that we have no reason to be puffed up, that we have no reason to put ourselves first. The result of understanding this is a humble view of self that leads to gentleness toward others. One that is poor in spirit and mourning over their sin will not be full of pride or consumed with self. They'll have a proper view of self in relation to their sin and God's grace that displays itself in gentleness. I was studying for this particular sermon and I read a excerpt from the expositor's commentary that I thought 
uh, helped with this particular thing here. The expositor's commentary, he said, we may acknowledge our own bankruptcy and mourn, but to respond with meekness when others tell us of our bankruptcy is far harder. Meekness, therefore, requires such a true view about ourselves as will express itself even in our attitude toward others. What has uh, Jesus been dealing with primarily in the first two pronouncements? Well, he's primarily been dealing with your attitude about yourself, hasn't he? That you realize your poorness of spirit, you realize your spiritual bankruptcy, and then your attitude about yourself becomes one of mourning, that you're mourning your sin, you're mourning your bankruptcy, and here what he's doing is branching out. What's the outworking of understanding that? How does that impact your relationship toward others? And Jesus says here that the natural progression of that is that you are me. That, that you realize that, that there's nothing good in you it has an impact on the way that we, that we treat others. It's not only an inward feeling of humility. It displays itself in how we relate to others. When the rubber of a right view of self meets the road of how we actually behave toward God and others, that's what's happening here when Jesus is talking about meekness. That we now have a right view of self in relation to the holiness of God, in relation to the perfection of God, and it has an impact on the way that we relate to our brothers and sisters. John MacArthur defined meekness this way. He said, meekness isn't weakness, it's power under control. Meekness isn't weakness, it's power under control. In other words, meekness doesn't mean you are weak. It means that the strength that you wield isn't untamed. I want you to think about this for just a moment. No one sees a lion and says, my goodness, look how weak they are. You know that there is an extreme amount of strength in that animal. You know that when, when you look at that animal, when, when, when you see them, you see their jaws and you see their teeth and you see the strength that is in their body, you, you don't look at them and say, man, they're, they're just the weakest. That's, that's the weakest thing ever. It may not be currently tearing someone's head off. It may not be currently ripping someone to shreds, but it's certainly not weak. When we talk about meekness in relation to us, what we're talking about is a tamed strength. We're talking about a strength or a power that has been brought under control and been submitted to the Holy Spirit of God. And so it's not a weakness, it's not a timidness, it's not a, a, an unwillingness to stand up for truth, it's not a lacking of confidence, it's a, it, it's a strength that's been brought under control, it's a strength that's been tamed Jesus set the example for us when it comes to this particular virtue no one in the history of the world has ever displayed such perfect meekness as Christ and you say well that's obvious isn't it Jesus was perfect and because Jesus was perfect and he always was submitted to uh, to the father and he always did exactly what 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 God's will is, and he always perfectly fulfilled the law. He always displayed perfect meekness. And so what I want us to do now is just take a few moments and look at ways in which we saw meekness displayed in Christ. There's one big way that I think all of you are probably thinking about, but there are other ways that I think we see Christ displaying meekness. The first way in which Christ displayed meekness is in his incarnation. You know, it's not Christmas time, but I think it's still fitting for us to spend a little bit of time talking about the incarnation. How is it that Jesus displayed meekness in his incarnation? Well, from the onset of his time on earth, Christ came as a meek and humble Savior. Think about who Jesus is. When Jesus came to earth, when he stepped out of heaven, what did he, what did he come as? A babe. He came as a babe. 
God with us, Emmanuel, the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, the king of glory, stepped out of heaven and came as a babe, came as an infant. He didn't come as a king normally would come. He was born to the most humble of people in the most humble of circumstances. And we see that uh, really uh, an exclamation mark put behind that in the way in which he was born. There was not even room for them in, in in the guest house. There was not even room for them. He was born in a cattle stall and laying in a manger. What an incredible display of meekness. That babe who was the king of the universe, the one whom, uh, by whom and for whom all things were created, he was born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough. He, he owns the world, and he came meek and mild. And so when we look at the incarnation, Christ set an example for us of meekness. He set an example for us of humility. During his earthly ministry, Jesus displayed a perfectly gentle spirit. Jesus said that of himself. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and your burden and my burden is light. Jesus said of himself, I am gentle and lowly. Jesus said of himself, I am meek, and he invited people to come and, and submit themselves to his lordship. We see his meekness displayed in those that he chose. Think about who he chose to be his disciples. Who did he choose? The Pharisees of the day, the, the rich. The nobility, Jesus chose the fishermen. Jesus chose the tax collectors. And he ate with sinners and he associated himself with prostitutes. Jesus was meek and lowly. We see his gentleness displayed in the way that he cared for the weak and the vulnerable. And the account in the Gospels when the children wanted to come to him and the disciples rebuked them. What did Jesus say? He said, let the little children come to me. He cared for them. He, we see him all throughout the Gospels giving attention to the weak and the vulnerable. Giving attention to those who could, could not ever do anything for him in return. Giving attention to those who were needy and weak. When he came into Jerusalem, what did he come on? A white horse? Did he come with a chariot? Did he come with armies behind him? He rode in on a donkey. The Savior of the world, the King of the universe, rode on a donkey. And he rode toward the most humiliating death that can ever be imagined. He rode toward Calvary. He rode toward the cross. Jesus perfectly displayed for us meekness perfectly displayed for us gentleness we see the meekness of christ on display in the trial leading up to his death and the humiliation of the cross look with me in isaiah 53 verse 7 isaiah 53 verse 7 what did the prophet isaiah say of christ some 700 years before he was born. We read this prophecy of the Messiah, and he says in Isaiah 53, verse 7, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. How did the king of the universe respond to his accusers? How did the king of glory, the perfect holy one, how did he respond to those that falsely accused him? Isaiah prophesied that he opened not his mouth, and Peter tells us 
The very same thing, Peter looking back at the cross in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter says, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. What's Peter say in verse 22? Christ was sinless. He did nothing wrong. There was never a time that he violated the law of God. There was never a time that he fell short of the glory of God. There was never a time that he sinned. There was never a time that he did anything worthy of any punishment whatsoever. And Peter says in verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. What was Christ's response to injury? What was Christ's response to those that that came against him? What was Christ's response? Like a lamb before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I want you to think for a moment about that definition of meekness, that meekness is power or strength that's been brought under control. And I want you to think about what Jesus displayed for us in that moment during his trial and as he walked toward the cross all throughout his earthly ministry as he dealt with people that hated him and sought to kill him and sought his life. We're talking about the Lord of the universe, the creator of the world, the one whom we read the account of him standing on a boat in the middle of the storm and stilling the storm, who had power over everything, the one through whom everything that exists consists. And when Jesus stood before his accusers, he was silent. He displayed for us perfect meekness. Perfect power and strength under control. He was being unjustly accused of crimes he didn't commit and was being led to suffering he didn't deserve, yet he did not revile and return. He did not open his mouth. Christ in meekness endured injury from others instead of seeking vengeance continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Peter says that's the example that Jesus has left for us to follow. Albert Barnes said in his commentary on this verse, he said, Meekness is patience in the reception of injuries. It is neither meanness nor a surrender of our rights nor cowardice, but it's the opposite of sudden anger of malice, of long-harbored vengeance. Christ insisted on his right when he said, if I've done evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Paul asserted his right when he said, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And yet Christ was the very model of meekness. It was one of his characteristics. I am meek, he said of himself. So of Paul, no man endured more wrong or endured it more patiently than he. Yet the Savior and the Apostle were not passionate. They bore all patiently. They did not press their rights through thick and thin or trample down the rights of others to secure their own. Man, what an excellent explanation of meekness and the example that we have set for us in Christ. Jesus in Matthew 5.5 5 is quoting pretty much directly from Psalm 37. Brother Eric read that for us this morning, the entirety of which is a statement, a testament to God preserving the righteous while the wicked are sure to perish. And in the psalm, there are continual exhortations to wait patiently for God to act because the days of the wicked are short. And in this psalm, in verse 5, the psalmist writes, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. 
Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. In Christ we see an example of humility that doesn't seek first place, but that places the interests of others before his own. We see an example of gentleness that cares for those who can give him nothing in return we see an example of mildness that endures injustice and doesn't seek after revenge but entrusts himself to god what did peter say jesus did when they were unjustly accusing him he entrusted himself to god he didn't seek to press his rights he didn't seek Anything but to entrust himself to the Lord. And I would simply ask you this morning, as we examine ourselves with the Scripture, as we take the text and, and, and look inwardly at our own hearts, do any of those things describe you? Are you described in that way? Or are you constantly seeking first priority? And only you know your heart before God. Are you looking out for self and those you have interest in only? Or is there a gentle spirit about you that isn't harsh and abrasive toward others even if they deserve it? Are you so keenly aware of your own unworthiness and God's kindness toward you that in Christ you, try, you strive to show that same kindness toward others? As you examine your own heart by the scripture this morning, what is it that you see there? Meekness doesn't mean that you allow folks to run all over you. It doesn't mean that you never speak out. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It simply looks like you entrusting your well-being to the Lord and seeking to display gentleness toward others. I have to admit this morning, listen, I've told you before, that every time I preach a sermon, Every time any elder here or anyone preaches a sermon, it's got to first go through the one preaching. And I would simply admit to you this morning that when I've examined my own heart and thought about this particular virtue, when I've thought about this thing that Jesus is extolling here and says that it's blessed, I've not always been faithful to display this kind of attitude. I look at my own life and I go, man, Jimmy, you are the worst. You fall so short of living up to what it is that God has called you to do and, and, and the way that God has called you to interact with others, the way that God has called you. And, and I'm reminded of just instances that, that may not have even shown themselves outward, but I'm reminded of instances in my own life where I have allowed myself to feel like, you know what, I'm being put on the back burner and I need to make sure that I'm getting what I'm owed. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to just sit here and be quiet and let people, you know, take advantage of me. And, and I'm reminded of times in my own life when, you know, throughout the process of years, and I'm looking back and going, man, you are just a wicked sinner. You, you, are just, you fall so short of what it is that Christ has called you to do and be. And for that, I confess to you this morning that I'm a sinner and that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any time that any of you have ever had to bear the brunt of that. And I thank you for your graciousness in return for not holding my sin over my head. I thank you for your graciousness in being patient with me and loving me through my sin. And I would venture to say that for many of you, the same is true. That, that when you genuinely examine your heart through the, the standard that Christ has provided for us here, you're thinking, man, I fall so short of what it is that God has called me to do and who it is that God has called me to be.
And if you're anything like me, when you're thinking through that particular sin, you're realizing that those that you live with see it most clearly, don't they? It's easy to fake a meek spirit when you're out in front of people. It's easy to come to church for a few hours and put on a smile and, and act very holy and act very righteous. And then when you get home, to act like a complete brute that forces your own way. When I think about this sin in my own life, I think, man, I, my wife and children have had to bear the brunt of my sin in this area. Maybe that's true for you this morning as well. As you're examining your heart, you're thinking about times when you've not displayed meekness the way that Christ has called us to. And if we recognize sin in this area, what's the answer? The answer is to repent. To, to, to look back at the other beatitude. What's Jesus say? Blessed are those who do what? Mourn. So take some time and mourn over that sin and be thankful that, that as the Scripture says, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness of God that shows us our sin. It's the kindness of God that exposes our sin and gives us opportunity to repent. And so turn from your sin. Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, happy are those who through a deep awareness over their own sin and a deep appreciation for the grace that they've been shown seek to display gentleness toward others. Why? Why are they blessed? Well, I told you this morning that the reason why this is blessed is because there's a gospel promise that's attached to it. There's a gospel promise. And so let's take the rest of our time this morning looking at what that gospel promise is. Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The first thing that we've got to come to terms with this morning when we read this promise is that it means something. And you say, well, Jim, that's the most obvious thing you've ever said, right? Obviously, it means something. But it's not just a promise that we read and pass over. It's a promise that we need to take time to try to understand. What does Jesus mean when he says that the meek will inherit the earth? Christ means something by this promise. And our job this morning is to seek to discern what that promise means. I would assert to you this morning that for Jesus' listening audience, this was a future promise, meaning it's tied to the new covenant. Christ was going to establish this covenant. Christ is going to establish this new covenant that was bought and purchased with His blood and that was secured with His resurrection. And so as Jesus is talking to them here in this text and they're hearing this promise, it's a future promise that's connected to the new covenant. Secondly, I would point out to you just how foolish this promise would have sounded and does sound to the world. To those that are blind to the glory of Christ. Think about how foolish this sounds. Who will inherit the earth? Who is it that will inherit the earth who is it that will rule and reign in the earth jesus says it's the meek it's the meek that will inherit the earth and the world says no it's not the meek it's those with extreme power and might they'll inherit the earth it's those that, that display their might and their power and they parade their militaries and their weaponry. That Those that display their awesome might, they will inherit the earth. And I would say to you, as I've said before, that kingdoms rise and fall. But there is one kingdom that is eternal. The Greeks attempted to inherit the earth with their power and they failed. The Persians attempted to inherit the earth with their power 
and they failed. The Babylonians attempted to inherit the earth with their power, and they failed. Many throughout uh, the centuries, throughout the years, have attempted to inherit the earth by the means of worldly power, and they fail. And Jesus says the earth is not inherited by human force. It's not inherited by human power. It's not obtained by worldly might. It's not won by human strength. The meek will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Through meekness, the earth will be won. I say to you this morning, what are the weapons of our warfare? What are the weapons of our warfare? Look with me in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Brother Eric made this point very clearly this morning as he was leading us in worship. And I'm glad that he did because it's exactly the same point that I'm going to talk about in this moment. What are the weapons of our warfare? In Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all. The saints, what are the weapons of our warfare? Friends, the weapon of our warfare is the gospel of peace. The weapon of our warfare is the gospel. And when Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth, I believe that what he has in mind is that the earth will be won through the gospel. It'll be through the proclamation of the gospel. And obviously, we look forward to a culmination of this promise, the the fullest realization of this promise upon the return of Christ, when Christ returns and makes all things new, when Christ returns and radically renovates the world. But I think that we see a progression of this promise even now as the church is is seeking to uh, proclaim the gospel and be faithful with the gospel. This is a promise both, both for future and a promise that's already being worked out. In other words, there's a sense in which the meek are inheriting the earth while we look forward to the glorious culmination of this promise. I want us to take just a moment and think about how is this promise being realized now? How is this promise being realized as we progress as the body of Christ and look forward in the future? What is God doing and what has God promised that He will do. I want you to think about, number one, what is the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church? And I, I promise I'll, I'll speed through this part, okay? I know it sounds like I'm getting ready to preach another sermon. And I might be, but bear with me. What's the mission of the church? Look with me in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, Christ commissioned His church, didn't He? He commissioned His uh, disciples. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What has the church been commissioned by Christ to do? The church has been commissioned by Christ to evangelize the nations. 
to make disciples of the nations, to take the gospel to every place so that they may, br- may be brought into submission to Christ. You think, what is a disciple? What's it mean to make disciples of all nations? It means that, that the nations may be brought into submission to Christ. That the nations may hear the gospel and believe and be brought into submission to the gospel. And we fight this battle not with weapons of earthly warfare. We fight this battle with the gospel. We go and we preach the gospel indiscriminately to all who will hear. That's what we've been commissioned to do. Now I want you to think about what Jesus said about his church. Look with me in Matthew 16. What did Jesus say about his church and about the mission that he's given them? Matthew 16, beginning in verse 17. This is after Peter had proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall what? Not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I want to make it plain this morning as we're discussing these things that Jesus did not say hell will not be able to prevail against the gate of the church. That's not what he said. What he said was the church will overtake the gates of hell. And so the picture that we have painted for us of the church is not one of this church that's in defense mode, that's hunkered down, afraid, and waiting to be rescued, even though we certainly are longing for that day when Christ will come and rescue us. But what we see is a church that is emboldened. We see a church that is on fire for their mission. We see a church that has embraced what God has called it to do and who God has called it to be. And they're taking the gospel into the world and the gates of hell are not going to stop it. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. I've been, honestly, I laughed a little bit probably shouldn't have but I did just recently this New Life Church in Canada what an awesome group of believers they are that have said you're not going to close our doors you're not going to stop us from worshiping you can jail our pastors you can you can defame us you can do whatever you want to do you're not going to stop us from worshiping and so what did what did the local government there in Canada do they went and they put a gate around the church what a what a awesome way to just let the scripture play out before our eyes right the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against the church Your little gate isn't going to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's not going to stop His church. Go ahead and put your gate up. The church is going to prevail against it. What's the church going to do? What what, what is the church? What did Jesus say about the church? Listen, friends, I'm tired, sick and tired of hearing the church portrayed as this weak body that's just hunkered down, afraid of what's going to happen to it. And sadly, in our own nation, we look around and that's what people are doing. There's churches that have been closed since last year. How ridiculous! That's not very loving of you. Jesus didn't call us to be a scared church. He didn't call us to be a weak, hunkered down, afraid church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What I see God doing among us is drawing a line in the sand. He's making a clear distinction 
between the righteous and the unrighteous? Who is it that's going to submit to Christ and follow Him? Who is it that's going to give in to earthly pressure? We don't have to wonder anymore, do we? It's been made pretty clear. Jesus said that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against His church. Now I want us to think a little while about how Jesus said the kingdom of God will advance and grow. Look with me in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 31. And remember, keep this promise in your mind, the meek shall inherit the what? The earth. How's the church going to advance and grow? What did Jesus say? How's the kingdom of God going to advance and grow? In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 31, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain, uh, like a mustard seed, that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air can come and make nests in its branches. What does Jesus say the kingdom of God is like? It's like a mustard seed. It starts out small, and then what does it do? It overtakes the whole garden. Its influence spreads throughout the entire garden. It absolutely dominates the garden. And you say, well, what, are you, what are you trying to say? I'm saying that's, the, that's what the church is doing. That's what the kingdom of God is doing. And don't think for a second that the kingdom of God is in retreat. Don't think for a second that because the world is against us and because there are those that hate Christ and hate His gospel and hate His truth, don't think for a second that the church, the kingdom of God is in retreat. The kingdom of God is advancing and it's growing. And Jesus' parable is being fulfilled before our eyes. The kingdom of God is growing into this massive tree that will overtake all the garden. Listen to verse 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Man, oh man. In case we didn't get it on the first parable, Jesus gave us another one to illustrate it a little bit more. What's the kingdom of heaven like? Jesus says it's like a woman that's got three measures of flour. She puts a little bit of leaven in all three. And what happens before long? That whole measure of flour is leavened. That that leaven has spread and influenced that whole measure of flour. And Jesus said that's what the kingdom of God is like. That's what the kingdom of God is doing. And if you're wondering this morning, how is the kingdom of God advancing and growing? The kingdom of God is advancing and growing exactly the way that Jesus said it was going to. Well, I look around us and it sure doesn't seem like that. Listen, America could be crushed to dust. And the kingdom of God is still going to advance and grow just like Jesus said it was going to. Think about God's sure promises. Psalm 110 verse 1. It's a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that really is prophetic of Christ after His resurrection. Psalm 110 verse 1. A psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord. What is the vision that David saw? David saw the Lord saying to his Lord. Well, who is David's Lord? David's king of Israel. Who's David's Lord? This is Christ. This is a conversation between the Father and the Son. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. What's the promise? And it sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? What are, what's happening to the enemies of Christ? Christ. 
They're being made a footstool. How are they being made a footstool? They're being made a footstool through the proclamation of the gospel of peace. The church is growing. The kingdom of God is growing. And the enemies of God are falling. Psalm 22, verse 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and He rules over the nations. What's happening? What's going on here with the kingdom of God? It's growing into this tree that's going to overtake the entirety of the garden. And you say this morning, well, I don't really believe that. That's okay. We don't have to agree on on everything. In fact, we don't all agree even among the elders what some of these things mean. I'm simply telling you this morning what I'm excited about when I read that verse. But I want you to understand this morning that there's something that, that all of us can agree on with this promise. That all of us have reason to be excited about and have reason to, be, to, to rejoice about. Regardless of our eschatology, all of us in the room believe that while Jesus came as a meek and lowly babe that was laid in a manger, he's returning as a great and glorious judge that will judge the nations. While Jesus came as a meek and lowly babe that was laid in a manger, he's returning as a great and glorious judge. And there's coming a day, as Brother Eric reminded us this morning, when he's going to return and he's going to set all of this right. When he's going to return and he's going to radically renovate this earth and, it's, and we're going to see the, the full realization of the new earth and who's going to live upon it and who's going to rule and reign upon it. It is the meek. It is those who have recognized their spiritual bankruptcy. It is those who have mourned over sin. And it is those who have lived with a true realization of who they are before God and man. The earth will not be inherited through force. The earth will be inherited through the gospel, through Christ and His promises. And together we look forward to the culmination of of all these things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your promises. We thank you for the confidence that we can have in your truth and we thank you for how your truth checks us, puts us in our proper place reminds us of who we are and reminds us of our deep need for you. Reminds us that we are nothing left to ourselves. Lord, I pray, God, that we would seek to glorify and honor you, that we would respond to your word in a way that makes it clear that your word has bore a fruit in us. God, I pray that you would help us as we leave this place to live lives that seek to exalt Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next Sunday will be our uh, deacon ordination service. And so we look forward to that. The deacons that the church approved last Sunday night will be ordained uh, this coming Sunday. And so we look forward to that service.